So that was the first part of our reading from Jeremiah today, the call story of the prophet. In chapter 2, we hear one of the prophet's first uh, oracles delivered to the kingdom of Judah. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your ancestors find in me, that they went far from me, and went after worthless things, and became worthless, worthless themselves? They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through, where no one lives? I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruits and its good things, but when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, once more, I accuse you, says the Lord, and I accuse your children's children. Cross to the coast of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. Friends, the word of God for the people of God. We have heard the word of God for us in the sacred text. Let us listen for the movement of the Spirit among us in the silence of our own hearts. Word and words, O oh God, help us to hear the one among the many. Amen. Remember last week how I mentioned that the book of Jeremiah is kind of a weaving together of these passages where the prophet is in deep grief and lament about what has become of the kingdom of Judah. Those passages weave together with these harsh 
words of judgment that Jeremiah is delivering to the southern kingdom of Judah as words of judgment from God. I don't know if, if you were thinking at all as I was reading that the, the words of judgment that Jeremiah is delivering to the kingdom of Judah may have some resonance for what is going on in our own country today. The priests do not ask, where is the Lord? Those who administer the law do not ask, where is the Lord? The scholar Jared Bias, um, who you can listen to, by the way, on a podcast called The Bible for Normal People, which I, hi which I highly recommend. He says that Jeremiah is making sense of God's promises in light of geopolitical turmoil. The historical context of the book of Jeremiah takes place in a time of great change and upheaval in the region. Previously, the Assyrians to the north have been the dominant geopolitical power, along with the Egyptians to some degree. But Babylon to the east is making a play to become the dominant empire of the region. The northern kingdom have, of Israel has already been destroyed and conquered by the Assyrians. And the southern kingdom is sort of looking with great fear and trepidation about what their own fate will be. King Josiah has died and passed the throne to his son Jehoiakim, who seems to be having trouble figuring out where his own loyalties lie. As a politician, he's a bit of a flip-flopper, uh, trying to make a deal with whichever uh, dominant national power seems to be rising to prominence. And he's kind of pissed off Babylon, for lack of a better word, for trying to forge an alliance with Egypt instead. The book of Jeremiah is compiled over a long period of time, so it's often difficult to tell if passages are from the standpoint of a period of time prior to when Babylon conquers the southern kingdom, or post-exile, when the prominent leaders of Judah have been taken into Babylon. The timing is difficult to reconstruct. But the critique of the people's waywardness, particularly the leadership, is utterly clear. Jared Bias says that there are three main themes in the book of Jeremiah. One is the theme of loyalty and allegiance. Who will we be loyal to. Jeremiah contends that the kingdom of Judah has certainly not been faithful to their covenant with God, and because of it, they will endure a season of destruction and desolation. The second theme has to do with passion and love. The kingdom of Judah has a heart problem. Jeremiah 5.23 says that they have 
stubborn and rebellious hearts that have been given over to self-sufficiency and greed. It describes the leadership as fat, wealthy, and sleek, those who do not promote the case of the fatherless or the poor. And the third theme is a sense of entitlement and an ideology of the status quo, which is most visible in the unhealthy alliance between church and state. The religious leaders believe that God is on their side no matter what and have become complacent and rebellious, not honoring the covenant in favor of protecting their own power and wealth and the status quo. And Jeremiah is calling for an end to the status quo and a new way of living. It only takes a little bit of a Christian imagination to imagine the ways that are in our own time. We live in a society of shattered covenants. I'm just going to name a few, but I'm sure that you all can think of others. Think about the disparities in our healthcare system, fully on display during COVID. Think about the ongoing evidence of systemic white supremacy in practically every aspect of our society, whether it is healthcare, education, the judicial system, the church. Here in Texas, we have a foster care system that is really in shambles. And just this week, the governor of Florida shipped some immigrants to the Northeast under false pretenses and promises of jobs and housing. We, too, are a nation that does not promote the case of the fatherless or the poor. Even the church in America is in decline and disarray. And I don't just mean like our particular church, but the institution of the church, whether we're talking about evangelical megachurches or um, some of our large mainline Protestant denominations. We are being called to account for the ways that our own institutions have perpetuated sexism and homophobia, racism, classism, ableism, and the like. I wanted to talk about this kind of grief today because I think it is the backdrop for our own individual griefs and our griefs and losses as a congregation. Grief is a normal part of life. Death and sickness and change are hard no matter what era you're living through, but when you are living in an era of such great institutional decay and decline, the whole backdrop is grief. And it would be really easy in this kind of context to look upon this desolation and decide that we are in no way implicated. 
we can say, well, but not all Christians, or not all white people, But the prophetic texts do not let us off the hook. They urge us to hold up the mirror to ourselves and ask, where have we displayed divided loyalties? Where have we become greedy or complacent and entitled? Where have we broken our covenants with God and one another? You know, back in the spring, the transition team began to lead us through some conversations that we called heart to hearts. I think that that name has a bit of a double meaning. Heart to heart conversations in the sense that they were a chance for us to sit down and just be honest with each other about some things. And heart to hearts because hopefully we were speaking from the depths of our own passion and love for this congregation. What I've heard reflected back from many of you is that we realize that there is a distance between our own professed values and commitments and our actual practices. Most often not because of any malice or ill intent, just because we have by accident or our own complacency or neglect not lived up to the fullness of who we desire to be. I want you to hear that we're not a uniquely flawed church in this way. This is really the state of the human condition. I think sometimes we look at these biblical stories and think, gosh, those people were so wayward and rebellious. It's just the same cycle over and over again. They break the covenant and God restores them and then they do it right over again. Only to realize in our more mon honest moments that this is just the pattern of being human. In fact, we may be unusually bold in that we were able to sit in this room and have such sincere heart-to-heart -heart conversations. And of course, the question is now, what do we do now that we've caught a glimpse of the space between who we aspire to be and who we are now. In scripture, the starting place for this kind of transformation is a kind of grief known as lament. Lament is a deep kind of grief. It's a kind of grief you need when the problems are so big, so overwhelming, that it's difficult to see a way through. In Lament, we start by telling the truth about the way things are. The truth that so many things are broken, not just one or two, so many things. In lament, we feel with great sorrow 
and acknowledge our own complicity in the brokenness. We cry out to God in despair because we recognize that though we are the ones who broke it, without God's help, we are powerless to fix it. These realizations are painful. But the power of lament is that once we have moved through the pain, we confess our faith and trust that somehow, some way, God will ultimately repair and redeem our brokenness. This is the way of biblical lament. It can be very tempting to avoid facing the depth and the breadth of our fractured world, especially when we've played a part. But lament is a soul-cleansing exercise It begins with grief, but the destination is hope. And when we have enough courage to practice it, on the other side we find again the God who is faithful. The God who is with us. The God who is sometimes enraged with us and yet remains true. In the liturgical calendar, Lent is the season that is designated for this kind of grief. But it's really our call to practice it year-round when necessary. So today we're going to sing a hymn of reflection that's really a hymn of lament. I hope that you let it break open your hearts, but not to get stuck in sadness or shame, but so that together we can move through it to a vision of God's restoration. May it be so. Amen. Please rise and join me in this hymn, number 202 in the Black Hymnal. (coughs) 